Long Distance Two by Toni Harrison is a moving, tender poem about love and loss and longing. I'll start by giving you a bit of background on the author. Born in 1937 in Leeds, Harrison went through grammar school and then to Leeds University to study classics. He benefited from the education system in a way that his parents hadn't and is very aware of this. Tony Harrison is a big name poet like Heaney or Hughes and like them his work appears on GCSE syllabuses. But unlike Heaney and Hughes, Harrison's still alive in 2023 and he's also a playwright and writes for television. In 2007 he was awarded the Wilfred Owen Prize. I think you'll find his poetry quite accessible and this may well be the one poem you remember long after your GCSEs because Harrison deliberately creates work that people can relate to and makes a point of giving a voice to voiceless people in his poetry. Death and our emotional response to it, grief, is something we still find difficult to articulate nowadays. This poem exposes this and I hope you'll agree that it creates a real response in the reader, that sense of loss that's so difficult to talk about. One of the reasons this poem is so powerful is that it's really honest. It is at least in part autobiographical based on Harrison's experience of losing his mother and watching his father's reaction to loss. In conversation with Simon Armitage on Channel 4, he said about his parents, I wanted to write poetry that they would like, but the irony was that I only found it after their deaths. I'll read the poem, but you can skip over this bit if you've read it recently. Though my mother was already two years dead, Dad kept her slippers warming by the gas, put hot water bottles her side of the bed, and still went to renew her transport pass. You couldn't just drop in. You had to phone. He'd put you off an hour to give him time to clear away her things and look alone, as though his still raw love was such a crime. He couldn't risk my blight of disbelief, though sure that very soon he'd hear her key scrape in the rusted lock and end his grief. He knew she'd just popped out to get the tea. I believe life ends with death and that is all. You haven't both gone shopping, just the same. In my new black leather phone book, there's your name and the disconnected number I still call. Long Distance 2 was published in 1981 in Harrison's collection Continuous 50 Sonnets from the School of Eloquence and it's the continuation of an earlier poem Long Distance 1 written in 1978 about the death of his father. The title is significant. If you think of the term long distance you may think of a long distance flight, something that takes many hours in order to reach your destination, often to see a person or a place that you love. Or perhaps if you're of a certain generation, you might remember a long distance phone call, which was expensive and again has connotations of going to considerable effort to reach or communicate with someone you love or someone you really need to communicate with. Or you might think of the term long distance relationship, where a couple are divided by distance and it's really hard to see each other. Patience and commitment are necessary. As the poem progresses, we understand that there's a gulf or distance in the marriage created by death but the father still loves his wife in fact he loves her so much that he has to pretend that she hasn't gone marriage is until death do us part as it says in the wedding vows but his love extends beyond the grave the term long distance could also refer to the other relationship in the poem, the relationship between father and son. Indeed, there's a gulf or distance between them too, and it's caused by misunderstanding. There's a strain on their relationship. The son cannot understand the way his father is grieving, and particularly in stanza two, expresses incredulity and irritation at his father's response to loss. Let's look at the poem line by line. In the first quatrain, note the use of the personal pronoun my, as in my mother. There's perhaps a childish sense of ownership here, which establishes that the poetic voice is her son. I think the possessive pronoun suggests closeness, but the term mother is rather formal. He's chosen mother, not mum, and there's a sense that the son has processed the reality of his mother's death in this poem in a way that his father hasn't. 
the consonants in two years dead and then in the next line dad with its harsh sounds exposes a harsh reality the mother is deceased in fact she's passed away two years already the diction choice of the adverb already seems to imply that two years is quite a long time long enough perhaps to process one's grief Yet soon after this realisation that the poem is about loss, we have a tripartite list of tender acts of care that the father still does for his wife. He keeps her slippers warming, as if she could slip on her feet and will be toasty warm. He prepares her side of the bed with hot water bottles, as if she's going to get into it. And he keeps her bus pass going, as if she's still alive and will need it. Notice the temporal marker still comes up a couple of times and in the poem, and here it's used to show that the father cannot accept that his wife is no longer with him. And notice that the diction choice of still contrasts with the earlier temporal marker already, hinting that the father and son are grieving in very different ways. Furthermore, the semantic field of warmth with the adjective hot and the verb warming have connotations of love and tenderness, which is something that the father clearly still feels for his wife. The picture of domesticity that's created for us also illustrates how their marriage has lasted a long time and that it was full of everyday routines. In the first line of the next quatrain, note that the personal pronoun changes to you. By you, he actually means I couldn't just pop round, I, the son couldn't just pop round. But the use of the second person pronoun is more impersonal and creates a sense of distance, even annoyance. This line is also highly punctuated. We have a caesura and then an end stop which makes it sound quite clipped and reinforces the sense of irritation. The reason that the son just couldn't pop round to see his dad or drop in is explained in the next three lines. It's difficult for father and son to see each other because of the complexities of the father's grief. The verb to phone is a reminder of the long distance call idea of the title and the monosyllabic words in the colloquial phrase put you off reinforces the sense of the father's grief pushing the son away. Note the enjambment here, which is even more noticeable as it follows the highly punctuated first line. It creates a sense of pace to illustrate how the father would be rushing around. The father requires notice of a visit because he has to scramble to hide the evidence of his grief and the fact that he pretends his wife is still alive. We notice the rhyme between time and crime. He's scrambling to hide evidence of this facade suggesting a sense of guilt or shame, which is really sad. He clears everything away and tries to look alone for his son, which in reality he is. Note the repetition of the lilting L sound, which really makes this phrase stand out. In his heart and in his imagination, however, the father can't bear to be alone. So the terrible irony is that when he's in his son's company, he has to give up a pretense of his wife being alive and therefore acknowledge his loneliness. His love is described as still raw, creating a vivid metaphor of love being painful. Grief is the price you pay for love. The adjective raw perhaps makes us think of an open wound or skin that's been rubbed raw, and it has connotations of pain or heightened sensitivity. We've already had a sense of the speaker's disapproval or lack of understanding of his dad's behaviour in this poem. And in the third stanza, we can see that the father couldn't risk his son's blight of disbelief. We get a sense here of two people grieving very differently and the grief creating a sense of alienation. The verb risk is interesting as it implies danger. We can imagine father and son having to tread on eggshells around each other. The father doesn't want to be found out as he's embarrassed and perhaps fears that he will be judged for his continued grieving. Father and son are responding very differently to the loss of the same woman. A blight is a disease and the father doesn't want to be infected or affected by his son's incredulity. 
because he needs to keep up the pretense is his way of coping. If you look at the diction choices of sure and new, in fact the verb new is in italics for emphasis, we can see that he is certain that he cannot be without her. The phrase very soon he'd hear her key with its intensifier and alliteration creates a breathless sense of anticipation. The image of the rusty lock is important and creates pathos. Whilst the father longs to hear her key scrape in the rusted lock, the uncomfortably onomatopoeic verb scrape and the adjective rusted suggests that time has passed and symbolises that she's not coming back. Yet these diction choices are juxtaposed with knew she just popped out to get the tea. The sense of hope here that everything will suddenly turn out to be all right and return to domestic normality is really poignant. Hopped is also an onomatopoeic verb, but it's a sweet and um, uplifting word, as is tea, meaning dinner or supper. And if you look at long distance one, you'll get much more of a sense of the father's language being very regional and distinctive. You'll really hear his voice in that poem. A sense of tragedy is evident in this stanza, as we become aware that the only thing that will end his grief is the return of his wife. And we know, and the poetic voice knows, that that cannot happen. The fourth stanza is surprising because it starts with a sense of finality. There isn't a heaven, when you're gone, you're gone. But after the end stopped line that reinforces this idea, there's a turning point, a volta. It transpires that after all, the son is like his father. The speaker has an awareness that they haven't both gone shopping, which refers back to the line, popped out to get the tea from stanza three and echoes it with the use of plosive sounds. But despite this, when both his parents are deceased, he still has their number in his address book. Note the adjective new address book, which shows that even after their death, he's written his parents' number in it. And it's a black book. This adjective has connotations of grief and death. What's more, he still calls the number as if for that moment when he's hanging on the line, there's a possibility that someone will pick up and that everything will be all right. There's a tonal shift here now as the son seems to have the same lack of closure as his father did. His love lasts beyond the grave too. Perhaps this is after all a normal human response. Perhaps disbelief is a part of the grieving response. This poem makes us question what it is to be rational or irrational. We end on the image of a disconnected telephone, which symbolises the severed relationship between parents and son. It's cut off by death. We are reminded of the long distance telephone call suggested by the title and that idea of trying to connect with someone who's travelled beyond this world when you just can't bear to be without them. I'll briefly talk about structure. The poem is neatly contained in four stanzas or quatrains, which supports the idea of keeping grief hidden behind closed doors. The father's grief is extreme, but it's contained as he's embarrassed by it. There's no outpouring of grief at any point. We just see the facade that the father maintains for comfort. In terms of rhythm, the vast majority of the poem is in iambic pentameter. That's the rhythm of everyday speech, and it makes the poem seem quite conversational, as if the narrator is confiding in us about his father's grief. It makes the poem seem really intimate and even more poignant. Harrison described meter as being like on a trapeze, but having a wire to catch you if you fall, and in a way it is a kind of safety net that carries the reader through this very emotional poem. The poem is 16 lines long, not 14, but as the title collection suggests, it is a sonnet. It's a Meredithian sonnet, and of course sonnets tend to be about love and relationships. There's an A-B-A-B -A -B rhyme scheme in the first three stanzas, but this deviates slightly in the final stanza, changing to A-B-B-A. -A. So the change in rhyme scheme signifies a change in tone from irritation to empathy on the part of the speaker. The tone of this poem is really tender and poignant, but there's also that sense of irritation at the beginning.
you might like to think about the message or the ideas that this poem conveys. I think it shows us the power of the human bond of love and the strength of devotion. We see a marriage bond continuing beyond the grave as the father refuses to give up the idea of his wife or his love for her. She's still present in his thoughts and his daily routine. In that sense, the poem is about long distance relationships, loving someone but not being able to be with them. And we certainly get a clear sense of that. The poem makes us question what rational or normal behaviour actually is. We see that grief is a very complicated business to which we all have different responses. Whilst there's initially incredulity at his father's behaviour, ultimately there's empathy and understanding and even a family resemblance in the son's response to loss in the last stanza. I hope you found this video helpful. Do please take a moment to give it a thumbs up and feel free to subscribe to the channel.